Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for the College of Continuing Education webinar, Become a Persuasive Business Storyteller. My name is Elena Gallagher, and I will be your moderator for today's event. If you have questions about this webinar or other programs we offer, please feel free to contact a learner representative in the Information Center. Contact information for the Information Center can be found on the last slide of this presentation. In today's presentation, the instructor will teach us methods to strengthen our presentation skills, specifically covering the topic of storytelling. We will focus on how to become a confident and strong presenter. The goal of this webinar is to help you commit to becoming a strong communicator, show the importance of practicing in a lower risk environment, and ultimately granting you the confidence to deploy as a fluent practitioner in the art of There are a couple of logistical points I would like to address. You can feel free to submit questions at any time during the webinar. The questions you submit will be addressed in the last 10 minutes of the presentation. To submit your questions, click the Q&A button in the top right-hand corner of the screen, then type your question in the box below and click Send. We will be sending out an email in the next few days with a link to the recording of this webinar. The link will be sent to the email address you submitted during your registration. I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Dean Hires. Dean is an emotional intuitive who has brought his natural skills to the challenge of protecting and defending vulnerability wherever he finds it. He focused his natural abilities with a degree in psychology from Gustavus Adolphus. A love for film has had him creating movies throughout his life. In 1999, Dean co-created an acting workshop and began honing his unique coaching style by working with actors facing the challenge of being authentic inside of artificial scenes. Dean used this experience to make the award-winning film Bill's Gun Shop, released through Warner Brothers. In 2001, Dean was hired by the U.S. government to train undercover agents in acting skills for deeper cover operations. This experience inspired Dean to recognize that his ability to direct performers could benefit non-actors facing true life audiences. He has put this theory to test over 10 years, proving its worth with over $3 billion in client wins. Author of Winning Presence for Business Presenters, Dean continues to coach as he professionally speaks and continues to develop independent movies. Without further ado, I give you Dean Hires. Thank you, Elena. Uh, great intro. It's really interesting to hear so, someone talks about a background when you hear the story that a background creates. Storytelling is an essential skill and it's an innate skill. It's something that we're born with, but we don't often break it down to come and understand it. And as we move into business storytelling, I'd like you to be thinking about what are make or break business stories for you. I think storytelling happens all the time, but there's certain moments that just make your life. You have an idea to pitch. You have a vision for something. You see something that someone else doesn't see. And it doesn't really make a difference whether your idea is better than another. It often comes down to your ability to pitch that idea. And from pitching the idea, you discover whether others will take it on. And I had a great idea once in a business setting. I worked in advertising, and I had an amazing idea I still to this day believe was the perfect idea, but I didn't pitch well. And when you don't pitch the idea well, sometimes the result isn't what you want. And my great idea died on the vine, even though I think it was the better idea. So I'd like you all to think, where do you tell business stories? What, what stories matter to you? And what makes it difficult for you to tell them the way you'd like to? And hopefully we're going to resolve some of those issues as we go. And definitely give us your questions so that we can make sure that we respond to them as we go. So let's start here. What is it that you want to experience? I'm going to use storytelling and presenting someone interchangeably because they're so much the same you can't present without storytelling. But I don't necessarily mean that presentation environment. Sometimes it's in a meeting room. Sometimes you're presenting to your boss. Sometimes you're presenting to your colleagues. There's many scenarios where presenting yourself uh, is, is a good capturing of what you're trying to do. But let's look at what we want. And from working with hundreds and hundreds of business presenters, 
confidence is probably one of the main things that you want. You step in one of those moments, those make or break moments where something is going to happen and your confidence isn't what you'd want it to be. And so we tend to really want to be strong in those moments because they have pressure to them. Another thing that we want is a connection. If you've ever had the experience of, of presenting to a group of people that aren't really listening to you, it's an extremely unnerving feeling. And it's not just that they're paying attention to you, but have you ever experienced when you get that click? Your, your, your words are flowing, your ideas are flowing, and there's this like magical click where you can tell you making a connection, you, your topic, and your landing with your audience. Knowing what to say is almost always listed as one of the top things that we want to experience. I want to know what to say. And I often draw a blank. Now, I, as a presenter, I draw a blank about once every five minutes. Just try doing a two-hour presentation when you draw a blank every five minutes. That's kind of what my life is like. But I know what to say, and that's the goal. And I want to feel passion and energized. I want to feel alive for my subject. And most people, when you talk to them, are really passionate. We talked to a man who was so excited about this event that he was leading, and his job was to be the MC. And when he got up to the presentation, he said, I'm so excited that you're all here today. We've got a real thrill ride ahead of you, and I'm sure you're on the edge of your seats as I am. And it's like his passion was gone. So we want to find that place where our true passion comes out so that we can see and experience an engaged audience. And we want commitment to action. We want to buy in. It's so great when you present or you pitch your idea and you get that clear buy-in that tells you we've landed. So this is the destination, destination of the journey that I'm hoping that we're on right now. There are some things, however, that get in your way. And based on most of the people that I've worked with and talked to, we have fear. Now, if it's not a lot of fear, you might call it anxiety. But one way or another, anxiety, stress, pressure, fear, it's an emotional experience that totally undoes our confidence. It makes us question ourselves. I'm a born self-doubter. It's one of my actual favorite things. I, I've learned to present because I have so much self-doubt. And I remember going to a presentation, and as I got in the elevator, I started asking myself questions like, who am I to talk about this subject? Why would somebody believe me? I'm not even sure if this is the right subject anymore. And the fear was starting to work the thoughts in my brain, and it was, it was doing the opposite of what I wanted it to do. And, and I stepped out of the elevator quite nervously. You can get up in front of the audience or the people in the meeting or your boss or your colleagues and have a sense of disconnection. When you don't feel that connection, it's an unnerving feeling. You feel like you're, the spotlight's on you. It can feel like an interrogation. And we suddenly find that we don't know what to say. There's so much that I could say. I've got this tiny little window. I, I've been working my whole life on this subject, and now I've got this tiny window to talk through. So knowing what to say is, or not knowing what to say is a big problem. We want to feel passion, but we have numbness. This subject that we believe in so strongly in our heart, we get up in front of the audience that we're talking to, and we feel nothing. And then my favorite is crickets. So you go in, even if you do know what to say and you've got your passion and you're talking to your audience, suddenly nothing's coming back. Sometimes you get blank looks. Sometimes you get no engagement. And that crickets experience can really get in the way. And finally, if you're not sure whether you got buy-in or not, that's really a challenge. You get ambiguous sense of commitment or you've got the blank stares and you're waiting to, to get the confirmation that you succeeded. This right here is the journey we're on. And I want to point out, and I believe, yes, we have a, a, a pointer you should be able to see. This section is the beginning of the journey, and this section is the end of the journey. This is the setup of a story, and one of the core concepts is whenever I'm presenting, I want to know what the story is. When it's a live audience, I often ask them these questions to hear from them what's in their way and where they're going. But these are the two essential elements of a forward-moving uh, concept. I want to know that we're going from the list on the left, which is difficult things, towards the exciting possibilities that are on the right. Now, in the middle of a story, 
is the content, the content, the actions that get you from one side that's not so good to another side that's better. And in the case of presenting, I like to keep it simple. And in my little pyramid here, I've got three corners, and I think there are essentially three cornerstones to good storytelling. And what I want to tell you, we're going to go into some depth, but it'll ultimately be simple. I have a friend who used to be a football player, and he would memorize all the plays, and there was this complex playbook to get through the game. I don't want a complex playbook. I want the simplest playbook possible. So I want to narrow it down to three concepts by the time we're done, even though we will delve deeply into them. The first is message. If you're going to have a good story, you need to have a, a good structure, a good message, a good way to say it. So the content that's delivered verbally is one of the obvious cornerstones. The next is the delivery of that message. I've got a great message. How do I deliver it? I've actually found that you can win on delivery with a poor message. You can lose on message uh, with a bad delivery. So, you know, if you have any one of these three things right, you're in a pretty good spot. And the third is connection. Ideally, I want a great message, an exciting delivery, and I want a connection with my audience. But you actually can get there to success with just one of, any one of these. So this is the goal. We're going to break down what makes a message. We're going to break down what creates a good delivery, and we're going to discover what makes a connection. That's the most elusive one, the connection. It's, it's hard to define. You know it when you got it, but it's hard to define. And so I want to start there. So this idea of a connection, I think of people who have gone to job interviews, they're, they're telling the story of their lives to win their way into a position. I, I really got a sense of it talking to some um, interviewees who would walk out of the interview saying, I really clicked with this interviewer. I know I'm a good candidate. I can feel the connection that we made. Still was hard to define what that is. So I want to get to a simple answer of what that is, and more importantly, not just what it is, but how you do it, how you manually create that connection. And I've had incredibly good luck with a very simple concept. So we've got to start by looking at this really, this is going to be a big, ugly chart. I don't like lots of information on my PowerPoint, but I'm going to fill this screen up because I want to get to one thing. Well, let's start here. Fear seems to be the thing that zaps our confidence, and fear is probably the number one thing that interferes with a connection. And when you can get to a place of passion, you're much more able to connect. So we've got several things across the top here. We've got activity. That's what you do. We've got thoughts that pop through your head. We've got the feelings that you're experiencing, and then you've got the body language that the other person sees. So. Let me start here. We read a study about um, some scientists who put two people on a roller coaster, and one of them was, was carefully cast to love roller coasters. The other hated them. And they put them through this adrenaline rush that they both experienced, and one screamed and yelled because he hated it. The other screamed and yelled because he loved it. And the scientists studied all the body information from the EEG, EKG. They were monitoring all the vitals. And they said it was the same response. There was no visual, there's no difference scientifically between excitement and fear. And so the scientists concluded there must be something, and this is the activity column, there must be something that people are doing that takes that extra energy and makes it fear or makes it excitement. So let's look at the person who resists the energy. Have you ever had this experience of, oh, ick, I can't wait till this is over. It, it'll be done soon that resisting of, of the experience that you get extra energy around. When you resist it, it triggers thoughts like, this is bad, I hate it. And when you get thoughts like, this is bad, I hate it, you're going to experience a dip emotionally. It's probably going to be anxiety. Let's start with this, this chain here. I got that extra energy, that butterflies feeling. I resist it, and I don't like it, and it creates, it transforms that energy into anxiety. Anxiety shows up in the body language and the person looks scared. Now, many business presenters that we've talked to have desired something else and they try to engage in a different activity. 
the activity being accepting. I accept this energy. And it's not a bad idea, instead of resisting it, to accept it. When you accept it, you get away from that this is bad kind of thinking. And your thoughts might be more like, this is okay. I can stand it. And suddenly, the emotional experience rises up from that negative into a more neutral, calm place. The upside is I have re reduced anxiety. But as a storyteller, this is not where you want to be. Not never, but not as your default, because the default of reduced anxiety, the default of this is okay, is indifference. And this is the place that so many business presenters speak. Instead of being nervous and scared, I want to be calm. And calm often looks like you don't care that much either way. And other than a few strategic times when you might want to be neutral, this isn't where passion lives. So we want to figure out what activity would take us to a different place. But I'm going to hold off on that. I'm going to talk about the thoughts. What I want is I want thoughts like this is good. I like it. I like this extra energy. This is what the guy on the roller coaster who liked it was thinking. Because when I get to those thoughts, that energy creates a positive experience and a feeling of excitement. And excitement is when our body language shows us as enthusiastic. So excitement is a majorly important uh, experience, but we have to figure out what activity it is. So after years of working with actors, undercover agents, business presenters, sales teams, I'm going to show you what the activity is, and it's a very simple one. It's the activity of appreciating. Appreciating is the activity that you can engage in that will transform that energy from fear to excitement. And so I'll tell you how to do it, but just so you know, I've used this. I was in court once. I was getting cross-examined, and all of a sudden I got this voice that was something like this, and I'm trying to be really confident, but it sounds so nervous, and I sound like I don't believe in myself. I couldn't do anything about it. I was so scared, and I remembered this activity. And so I engaged in appreciating the subject, the people, this court case. And suddenly my voice came back, my confidence came back, and I got to be uh, in control of making the connection. So I'm going to make this simpler now that we've looked at this ridiculously complex chart. Um, and I want to get clear about the practice. And the goal is to create that click with the audience, the people you're storytelling with. Appreciating is a practice, it's an activity. You ask yourself the question, what can I appreciate about this person, this thing, this situation, this subject? And when your brain gets used to the pattern of asking itself, what do I appreciate? What can I appreciate here? Suddenly, answers come. And so for about a month, I practiced asking that question. I would look at a cup and ask myself, what do I appreciate about it? My brain would say, it's how I drink. It's how I get water. It's actually beautiful. I would find that I had a credible potential to appreciate good things and bad things. And I found that even when I was facing a situation I didn't like and asked myself a question like, what do I appreciate about it? I might appreciate that it gives me a chance to test myself. I get the chance to see how I respond under this situation. I can learn from it. So I want you to consider practicing this Take a week and give yourself reminders on your calendar to ask yourself, what do I appreciate about this person while I'm talking to them? Try it in an argument and watch how you have more control over the tone of that interaction. That's how you make a connection. So what it looks like is when I'm talking to, so there's you and there's them. What I want is I really want to put my attention on that other person. I really want to see them and focus on them. Keep the attention off myself, but move it over there. Secondly, I want them to know about that. So I use my eye contact to make uh, that connection evident. They know I have my attention on them because I'm looking at them. And then I want you to listen to how my voice changes in, as I go into the following uh, sentence. I start to appreciate them. You hear my voice respond to this feeling? I'm appreciating you as I imagine you because I can't actually see you. And that's difficult, but I can imagine you, and I'm appreciating you, and you hear my voice respond and soften. And if you're in a live presentation, you'll get feedback. You'll see it in their faces. So you don't need to stare at a blank audience. You appreciate them awake, and you bring them into the conversation. Does that make sense? So the one-word answer is appreciation, and appreciation gives you the warmth. 
but I want to spend a little more time on eye contact. And unfortunately, this is the part where I can't show you eye contact. I'm going to talk about it. And I put a link on the bottom. I, I did a TEDx talk, and um, it's a place if you want to go look at that link um, or just put my name into uh, uh, YouTube and you'd find it. And you'll see this in action. But let me just describe it. Look at this wonderful face. This person is so confidently and positively engaged with her audience. I learned something about eye contact that's pretty simple to summarize. And I learned it when, of all things, I, was, I had a presentation in the evening and I was in a park feeding birds. And I tossed a pile of food out and the birds fought over the food. And it was not a pretty experience. And I, it just sort of left me feeling kind of soured. And I went and bought another bag of bird food because I was with my kid and I wanted uh, a, a fun experience. So I tossed one breadcrumb over to the right and then I tossed one over to the left. And then I tossed one back, and then I tossed one close, and the birds started to spread out. And I started to notice, it's not like you give half a breadcrumb to a bird. You give them a whole breadcrumb. You don't give it to them, take it out, and give it to someone else. And pretty soon I was noticing that this bird, uh, collection of birds, they looked like an audience. And I thought, you know, that's how eye contact should be in a presentation. I should look at a person for a sentence. And a sentence would be the equivalent to a piece of bread. So that night, I tried it out, and I've been presenting this way ever since. I never present to a crowd. I only present to one person for a sentence. And then I switch to another. And I stay with that next person for a sentence. They get direct eye contact. They get attention, and they know that they were delivered one crumb of my presentation. And I continue that pattern randomly working around the room. I don't want to work from one side to the other like a sprinkler system. It's more like a ping pong ball game. One in the front, one towards the back, one to the right, one to the left. And what I found is that, and this works just the same with three people or two people. I want to directly address people. And the one sentence a person rule, instantly people were telling me, you're so confident. So let's review this idea of how you get this connection. One problem you have is fear. That's what's in the way. The feeling you desire is excitement and warmth, and the action to take is appreciating. The second thing you've got as a problem is your body language can appear hesitant and nervous, and you want the desired body language of confidence. And confidence, the action to take, is direct eye contact about a sentence a person. And when you do these two things, appreciating with direct eye contact, you have a warm connection. And that's all you need to know to form that connection, whatever you're going to talk about. Now, where is your attention when you're presenting uh, with warm confidence? Focus on, keep your attention on individuals in the audience, one at a time, and your content. And what can you do prior to presenting when you get hit with the butterfly feeling of anxiety? Well, appreciate that extra energy, and what you'll do is you'll turn it into anticipation and excitement. So before I leave connection, one question that was uh, raised by Elena was, um, what about if you're using a script? And some people present from a script. I tend to prefer the improvisation to the script, but I've done a lot of work training, of all things, clergy who do weddings and that sort of thing. And what we work on is just don't talk to the page. Now, assuming you're going to use your thumb to mark your place on your page, what you do is you look at the sentence in silence. Then you look up and deliver as much as you can to a person. Then you look back to your notes in silence and capture the next bit, and then go back to your audience and deliver it to people. We found that people are totally comfortable with the pauses when you read your notes. What, what doesn't work as well is when you're talking to your notes and you're trying to find your place and you're trying to maintain that, these pauses don't hurt anything. And it might sound a little bit more like what I'm doing right now. But if I were using a script, it might sound like this. And this is coming to you, person. And the silence is where I'm reading it. So that's what I would try doing. Allow the break. Don't, don't, don't give yourself the impossible task of making the sentences go without stopping. Give yourself the break points. And that usually makes, um, allows you to make the connection while you're reading from a script. All right. Deep breath, for me anyway. We're moving on. Take note of what you know now. 
that maybe you didn't know before. Think about what of this comes easy to you and think of what you'd like to strengthen or what questions you have for me as we, when we get to the end. I'd like to move on to methods. This is more what people want to hear about. I want to know what I'm supposed to say. How do I tell that story? How do I structure that message? And I want this to be equally simple. The problem is it's too much information. We have a sea of information. Usually if I'm going to share about something, I have years of thought into it. So, or, or a month of thought. It doesn't matter how much, but it's usually a lot of information. And the question is, what exactly out of all this information should I say so that you'll get my point? I, I think of job interviews where you're going to talk about your whole life and you've got you know, 20 minutes to try to pull, pull the important parts out. How do you know what to say? So I use story structure to organize that information. It's what I learned from film, but I also discovered that social scientists have um, – they believe that story structure is how our brain processes information. So it's not like we learned to talk and then in invented story. It's that we were processing information in stories and we had to find a way to communicate it. So we developed language because we process in story structure. And every culture developed a very similar version of language. And even before language was uh, cave drawings and such, what they say is you see the same story structure in every communication that human beings have ever made. So, well, how about that? Why don't you use that method then? Use the simple story structure because everything you want to communicate is better and is, is more easily understood. And if you don't tell the story, they're going to take your data and they're going to create a story out of it. And we worked with a group of people where they would present and then we would, the audience would say what they learned from the story. And the, the presenters were shocked at how many different interpretations of what they were trying to say came out. Story structure helps you with that. So the good news is you already know story. Story is basically beginning, middle, and end. What you may not know, as I didn't necessarily know, what is the job function of these three things? The job function of beginning is to establish a starting situation. Nothing's happening. The situation is just what it is. The job function of the end of a story is very similar to describe a situation, the ending situation. What you need to understand is these two are not the same. The point of communication is to describe a change. And if you have a starting situation that somehow becomes an ending situation and those two are different, you have thus created a story. So. Everyone knows in literature the famous rags to riches story. It's one of many of the archetype stories that are out there. Well, that's because rags to rags didn't work. Riches to riches doesn't work. Rags to riches describes a change, and that's what storytelling is about. Interestingly, there's an emotional component. Story is a head-heart uh, device. The, the mind part understands situation. The heart understands feelings. And stories tend to go from a not-so-happy beginning to a happier ending. And that's mostly because we're motivated to move forward. We're not climbing our way down the corporate ladder, at least not hopefully. We're, we may pay money to go see a tragedy, but we're not trying to live one. So in most business communication, we are talking about how one situation that's not so good got much better and felt better. That's what business communication is about. And most of what you have to present is in the middle. There was an action that occurred that caused the not so happy beginning situation to turn into a happier ending situation. Is that making sense? Maybe we turn it into business speak and make it even clearer. A not so happy beginning is a problem or a challenge. An action in the middle is your solution. The happier ending situation is your goal outcome. So beginning, middle, and end oddly aligns with problem, solution, outcome. And too many people think the equation in business is problems and solutions. Well, problems are bad and solutions are a lot of work. If you don't add the last component, the outcome, the goal, you don't have a complete story. So one other element to understand with story structure and how you structure your information, there's a main character. There's somebody who the story is about, and it has to be somebody that your audience cares about. So your audience, if it were parents, we know they're going to care about, every audience cares about themselves. If it's parents, they might also care about children. So you can think, if it's a hospital, they may care about their organization. They might also care about patients. You need to pick a main character that your audience cares about. And the main character is whoever is in this not-so-happy beginning situation and whoever is trying to get to this happier ending situation. 
This is where your main character lives. You, interestingly enough, with your solution and your information are in here. Technically, this is the hero of the story. The hero is whoever provides the action. So when I'm telling a story, I'm talking about how main characters facing this, somebody is going to provide an action that essentially, I never use the word hero, but heroically plays the role in guiding the main character to a better place. That's how stories work. Very simple. So let me just give you one. Um, in my business, I set, someone says, Dean, what do you do? And I make sure I'm not the main character. Dean, what do you do? Well, business professionals face stage fright when they're presenting. I bring movie set skills that get a good message and a, an exciting delivery and a connection so that they have winning presence under pressure. That's a complete story. All right, so I want to talk about how you build a story. And this is a great chart to uh, uh, refer back to. I often, when I'm starting a presentation, I think I write down who my audience is and then I define the main character. Half the time it is the audience. Sometimes it's or more than half. Sometimes it's someone else. So I once worked with a group that it was a, a group of salespeople uh, or business executives. The main character was the board of directors because that's who everybody was focused on. But usually these are the same. So then I try to define what situation and feeling is going with the, with, uh, what situation captures the now that they're in. And I want to point out when I'm plotting out a story, I don't go in story order. I hop from the beginning to the end. I want to figure out where they are now and how they feel about it. And then I want to define where they're trying to get to and how they would feel then. That way, I can test my middle to make sure it is a middle that would take you from the beginning to end. So in my example, film skills would take someone from stage fright to stage presence, so that makes sense. We find when people don't build stories in this order, they often meander and turn into something else. My mom used to say to me, is it sunnier in the, is it rainier in the summertime or in the mountains? You'll notice how that doesn't make sense. If you said, is, some, is it rainier in the summer or the winter, that would make sense. So the next thing to understand that's very interesting, stories tell in any order as well. Of course, in film, Quentin Tarantino proved that pretty well. But in presentation, we have found it's very much the same. So let me give you a sort of a silly little story. Our meeting room is falling asleep. I need them to stay awake because this is a real important meeting. Can somebody get a pot of coffee up here? Now, notice the order I took and I, I developed it in this order. It tells just as well the traditional way. My team's falling asleep. Can we get a pot of coffee? I need everybody awake. Then let's look at a different order. I need my team awake, but they're falling asleep. Can we get some coffee? It seems that no matter what order you take, as long as you have these components, you are free to tell a story and it will make sense. The brain doesn't need it to go in order, but I always try to make sure that I get these done before I define this. And if I have a preference, I have found that I tell more beginning and middle stories than any other. So building a story, think beginning and middle. Telling your story, you can tell them in any way you want. Now, then you get into this next piece of, of structuring, say, a presentation. You've heard Aristotle say, well, you tell them what you're going to tell them, then you tell them, and then you tell them what you told them. That's intro, main, body, and close. So people have asked, well, what's the difference between beginning, middle, and end, and intro, main, body, and close? Well, the fact is a presentation may have a ton of stories in it. And this is another chart that you can fall back on. Tell them what you tell them. What you're going to tell them is one story. I might say in this presentation, you are facing all sorts of challenges that get in your way when you're telling your stories and you want to be a great storyteller. We're going to look at the three pillars of or the three cornerstones of presenting. There I just told you what I was going to tell you. And then we are now going into the main body where I told you stories about how to connect to an audience. We're in the process of exploring the point uh, of, of how, to, how to structure the message itself. And then we're going to look at dynamic delivery. So each one of these has its own story, and I use the same structure to develop it. And when I'm done, I'm going to review. I'm going to say, hey, when we started here, we were facing some real big challenges as presenters, and we wanted to get to a very confident uh, winning presence, and we looked at three cornerstones. Here they are. Here they are. So this is tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, then tell them what you told them, and all of these have stories in them. 
You'll also notice there's these two little parts here, a hook and, and credits. I think of a movie, they always start with an exciting action scene before they run the titles. I often start with just some little fact or figure or exciting story to land people in the room, and then I tell them my name and what I've done. So this is an order that I often follow. Then way down here is Q&A. And when you get into Q&A, what I want you to recognize is Q&A can have stories as well. So what you want to think about is when someone asks you a question, can you, if possible, have the beginning, middle, and end in it so that your answers are as complete as possible? All right, so definitely a chart to, to uh, process for a while, but the sum is we're going to tell them different stories across a presentation, and we do want to tell them what they're going to experience, then go through it in detail, and then review it. All right, second breath. We're coming up in the last six, seven, eight minutes of, of the presenting portion. I want you to make sure you think about what do you know now that you didn't know? What if this comes easy for you? What would you like to strengthen? And, and if there's something you want to strengthen, give us a question. Maybe I can help. We have to tackle delivery next because, okay, so now we know how to make a connection with the audience. We use that appreciation, the eye contact to show confidence that's warm and that pulls them in. We have a message that makes sense because it goes from a beginning to uh, an end with actions in the middle. And by the way, you're the main character of this because you're the one, you audience are the ones in the beginning and the end as I present to you. Then there's a simple question of delivery. I once did a presentation that I was absolutely unprepared for. And later when I thought about what I told them, I'm sad to admit it really wasn't the best. But I hit it out of the park on delivery. And if you can deliver powerfully, um, I'm not recommending that you go in with poor information and deliver it well. But delivery is a zone to win on. And I've seen the reverse happen. So dynamism is the word that I use for um, what exciting presenting is. And dynamism is kind of hard to pinpoint. It's a lot like talking about, I don't know, charisma. What makes someone charismatic? It's, I, you ask 10 people, you get 10 answers. So I wanted to try to come up with something that I could believe in and lock in and stand behind, and this is it. I got there visually because I was actually watching a show where somebody was in the hospital and you know, their heart stopped and they were trying to revive them. And they had a non-dynamic line on that oscilloscope. It looked like that. That's the line you don't want. And that means if you're presenting flat, everything remains consistent. So what do you do to make a line more dynamic? Well, I thought, actually in the show, they, they actually revived this person. So relieved. Uh, it was a character I liked. And all of a sudden, we had something more like that. When you see the highs and lows, look at how much more dynamic that line is, as simple as it is. The only way to be more dynamic that I can think of, I guess there's two ways. One I'm not illustrating, which is higher highs and lower lows is more dynamic than little highs and little lows. But more dynamic is also random. If you can't, well, this has both. It has higher highs and lower lows, and it also has, um, ha it has unpredictability to it. But the simple way to look at this is dynamism, if you made a formula out of it, dynamism equals change. If you change stuff, you're visually interesting and, and you're, you're interesting as a storyteller. If you don't change, you're not, which is why the podium is the death of the presentation. Go stand up in front of the podium. You're only there because you want to hide behind it anyway. You put your, your hands on each side of this and you don't move. You aim the mic and then suddenly you become consistent. And you can put people into a trance if you keep talking consistently. You have to get some variety in it. <clears throat> so. The question becomes, what can you change? Well, I usually work with six things. I bet the list could be bigger, but I work with six. And the first one we've already talked about, eye contact. Every time I switch from one person to another, there is a change, and that change keeps the room engaged. So there's not much more to say about eye contact because we've already covered it. A really powerful one is speed, how fast you're talking. We've noticed that about 90% of all presenters present at one rate no matter what. They start, 
and then they keep going. And then unfortunately, this is where the ums come from because what they do is once they establish this pace, they believe, wow, I can't really stop this. So um, 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 when I need to think, I actually make this, um, uh, um, um, I make this sound because I've set up the expectation that it has to continue. And then you've got the fast talkers who talk too fast because why you have too much energy and they don't know what to do with that energy and it just speeds them up and they had no idea they talk so fast. Well, we, in both of those scenarios, we don't tell people not to talk fast. We say talk faster. Oh, and slower. If you get people talking faster and slower, you've got dynamism. because You've got highs and lows. So let me show you this a second. First of all, I've got to teach you about slow. Slow isn't like a tape recorder slowing down. It's more like putting big gaps in it. So I've got a sentence, and I'm going to put in some really powerful gaps. And these gaps seem to make significance out of my sentence. But I also want to sometimes go really fast because excitement energizes while the slow makes it significant. So the practice here, just try this sometimes. You don't have to present in this pattern. But I like to try a fast sentence and then the very second sentence is going to have the gaps. And then the third sentence is going to be really fast again. And the fourth sentence, I'm going to reintroduce the gaps. So if I put this to life, I would say, my name is Dean Hires, and I work with business professionals. Now, a lot of business professionals find themselves gripping with fear when they face the, the presentation. They get stage fright. But that can be changed. So you hear me alternating my speed? I practice that, and then I forget about it when I present, and I find that my speed changes on its own randomly, which is what I want. Um, I'm going to go to volume. I'll cover these all very briefly. But volume is really simple. Sometimes you're loud, sometimes you're soft, and very few people vary their volume. So the thing about loud is when you get loud, it pulls the audience awake. It shakes them. And it's really high energy and exciting. But when you get soft, it pulls them in like a, like a, like a scary movie. Uh, maybe that's not the best analogy. But um, you pull them in. It draws you forward. And movies have known for years to change those things. If you watch almost every loud, exciting action scene, it's followed by something quieter and intimate. And so when you change those and you practice letting those highs and lows come in, you're suddenly way, way, way more dynamic. Now I'm going to go to gesture. Gesture is simply talking with your hands sometimes and sometimes not. And the only reason I bring this one up is we found that there's a lot of questions when you find yourself in a presentation, what to do with your hands when they don't have anything to say. So the simple answer of gesture is this. I, want to, I love to talk with my hands. I talk with my hands as much as possible. And then I drop them to my side loosely and I try to avoid clasping them in front. Uh, I try to avoid the handcuff uh, at ease position with my hands behind me. I avoid my pockets. I let them just hang straight down. And there's, there's nothing protective about that, which is the advantage. When I am standing up with my hands just loose and hanging at my sides, I, I appear unguarded with nothing to hide. And then I burst into gesture and I let my whole body communicate. And I probably only do the pauses with my hands at my side for a little bit of time. Most of the time I, I gesture. All right, almost done here. I just want to recommend moving and stopping. In terms of movement, the highs would be sometimes I'm walking and I take at least three steps so it doesn't look like a fidget. And then I stop like a pillar. And those two together create so much interest. The person moves almost like a general sizing up the troops. And, or maybe someone having a conversation as they stroll through the park. And then they stop. And they talk from one place like a fixed pillar. And those two add a lot of dynamism. And the last one is emotion, which I'll summarize. I have a class on emotion and emotional intelligence. But the simple answer is feel your words. The things you're saying have feelings, and they're all different. And so emotion creates its own set of highs and lows as you feel the happiness when you're talking about good things, or you're feeling the sadness that empathizes with, say, the loss of a team. And anger is a very valid emotion because it shows seriousness. I'm not mad at anyone. I am using this energy to show that I mean it and my commitment is real. And 
So happy, sad, and mad work together. All you have to do is open yourself up to feeling your words and let them, let them show, let them take your voice. So together, these six things, we just practice them separately. When I'm doing a presentation, I'm going to do five minutes of practice, just making sure I'm talking to a sentence, a person, which might be an empty chair if I'm presenting it, practicing in my room. In terms of speed, I make sure I'm talking fast sometimes, and then I slow down. I move by walking sometimes and stopping. I get loud, and sometimes I get soft. And I gesture, put my hands at my side, and then I'll do a presentation run where I just try to feel it. I just try to feel it. Those things will get you to dynamism. And I believe we can do a quick review. Take a moment, think about what you know now that you didn't before. Think about what of this comes easy for you and are there any skills that you'd like to strengthen related to your delivery? And maybe you'll have a question for me. But in summary of this presentation, to become a persuasive business storyteller, you simply have to do three things. Appreciate to get that connection with the audience. And see the simple story to structure your messages and the story structure, not the words. The structure is the power. We talk about who's in what situation that's not as good as it could be, what needs to happen to take them to what better place. And delivery is change. Don't be one note through your presentation. Take advantage of these simple dynamics and above all, feel your words so that you can come alive in your delivery. And together, connection, message, and delivery will give you the powerful business storytelling that you've been looking for. So that's the presentation. I do want to point out um, this January, I think January 11th, I'm not sure of the date, but we released a film called Winning Presentations, so it's a business film. Uh, definitely check our website, sagepresence.com, and we have a blog. We offer free tips. There's a lot of information you can get if you want to follow me. And at this point, I'm going to turn it back to the team and steer me from here. Well, thank you, Dean, for that incredibly intriguing and exciting presentation. You're welcome. As I stated at the beginning of the webinar, we will be sending out an email with the link for the presentation soon. This is the time we would like to open up for questions. If you have questions, please submit your questions again by using the Q&A button in the top right-hand corner of your screen. The first question that we have for you, Dean, is, you have worked with a lot of actors and people in the entertainment industry. What is another industry or field you consulted in that you never dreamed of working with? Wow. Well, I kind of have to start with the undercover world and police. I, I would never have dreamed of such a thing. Um, we were doing this acting workshop, and it was a particularly strange time in my life because um, I wasn't sure where life was going at that point, and I was parking my skills inside of these acting training programs. And all of a sudden, we got this call, and it was an agent, a special agent from, I think, Department of Interior, I'm not sure, Homeland Security, in any case, they were building a, they called it a spy school, it was an undercover agent training school, and they wanted some acting teaching there. And I hung up on them, I thought it was a prank phone call. It, I was sure it was my brother playing a joke on me and the person called back. And, uh, and next thing I know, uh, my partner Pete McAleck and I are on a plane and we're flying to the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center at Georgia. And it was really, really scary. You get in front of this, we're in the, one of those little Gomer Pyle Quonset huts, and there's this group of undercover agents, and we're supposed to teach them. And the first thing I said was, um, you know, how do you feel about this training? I wanted to get some, some attitudes from the room. And the first thing I got was, I can't imagine why a couple of artists have any business teaching us anything. What experience do you have that justifies you being here? That was the introduction to that. And we had to hold our own to make the connections to the storytelling material and the situation they faced. And very quickly discovered everyone in the room had seen a partner die. They had all had a gun put to their head and they needed to manage incredible fear. And we used these same te techniques with them. And what was reported after was amazing. We, our feedback was like, boy, when I first si was assigned to this, I thought it was the stupidest thing I'd ever heard of, but I'm going to use techniques I learned here for the rest of my life. And, um, you know, since we've gotten feedback from people that said, you know, it saved their life being able to use appreciation when the gun's put to their head. And, you know, so we've tested this in some pretty extreme cases. The other one would be lawyers. I have coached uh, three winning murder trials. 
Um, I've coached a lot of, of legal scenarios, uh, witnesses, expert witnesses. I don't know anything about law, but I can coach uh, the, a winning murder case. And, uh, and that is the storytelling of that and the delivery. And we'll have lawyers that, that the, the jury doesn't like them. They don't click with their audience or they get too rap, they get mad, you know, and, and so we can work with all of those things with these same tools. So there's two examples. Wonderful. Well, that certainly is interesting. Thank you for sharing. Um, so another question, what do you recommend is most of your presentations, sorry, if most of your presentations are conducted via webinar and you don't have eye contact? Are there other areas to specifically focus on? Great question. And right now, this is outside of my comfort zone. I'm doing a webinar with you all. And what I did is instead of eye contact, I visualized you audience members. So I pictured somebody and I looked at the screen and in my mind's eye I could see you. But what I want to point out, the appreciation component was bigger than the eye contact since it wasn't, uh, it wasn't available to me. So just to show you the difference, I, I did this before, but I'm trying to neutralize my heart right now and I'm just talking about information and I want to see if you can hear the difference when I shift from that to appreciating. Now I'm appreciating you, the audience. Can you hear my voice change? So much goes through the voice and appreciation and lights me. Now you, I'm moving. I'm looking to the screen like you're a person. Um, but but all you get is the voice. And so so much comes through the voice. Um, I often stand. I'm not right now, but I usually stand when I do a webinar. I let my hand gestures be alive, and I I kind of present to the screen. Um, and doing Skype and and Google Hangout has helped me learn. Um, if you're doing one of those, uh, say a webinar that's got video conferencing or something like that. Make sure you recognize the difference between where the camera is on your screen and the screen. I've learned to look at the camera lens because it's more direct eye contact. And I did a presentation recently where most of the people were live in the room and then there was this one camera that represented a, pe a remote audience. I made about every fourth or fifth connection to the lens. So I would talk to a person, there's a woman right over there, I'd talk to the man over there, then I'd look right in that camera lens and I'd talk to all those people, and I included them equally. So if you do have video, recognize the lens, and if you don't, just trust your voice and the feelings to bring people in. Story structure still works, appreciation works, um, a lot of the dynamism stuff isn't visible, so you're reliant on the voice. Wonderful, thank you. Can you elaborate a bit about persuading a client or customer, maybe via a conference call to discuss issues? Um, yeah, sure. The, the thing about uh, talking to clients and discussing issues is you, you, the fallback that gets us into trouble is we let ourselves be the main character. This is about me and whether I keep my client and whether I did the right thing or whether they finance my idea. And what you really want to focus on is making sure they are the main character. So when I'm working with a client, and this also is true for sales presentations, um, as I, I'm, I think we hit the four billion in winning sales pitches that we've coached, which is a pretty big number. And what you have to focus on is they are the main character. So in terms of an issue, let's say that you've got a customer who's not happy about something. Well, boy, I know what part of the story that is. That's the not so happy beginning. So if I'm talking to a customer, I want to figure out what not so happy beginning, what challenge or problem are they facing now, and then I want to reverse it. Don't solve the problem. Fight off your urge to solve the problem. Just clarify what's the problem and then what's the success outcome, what's the goal. If I know those two things, then I can use active listening and say, I just want to make sure I understand it. Right now, your team is a little bit irritated because you thought you were going to get something on Friday and you didn't. Is that right? When they say, yes, that's right, their tension goes down. And, and ultimately, the goal is you want to make sure you don't miss your deadline for this month. Is that, is that success for you? Yes, yes. Okay, so let's talk about what we can do together so that you get from where you, where you are now to, to that goal. So what I did is I quickly made them the main character and I talked about their problem and outcome and lastly, I tried to solve it with them. So I tend to create collaboration and there's one other trick of this. I try to make we main characters. So wherever possible, well, we're, okay, so let's talk about what situation we're in right now. We're all behind, uh, uh, behind eight ball, however that phrase goes, because of that deadline last Friday. And success is meeting that objective for the end of the month. Let's talk about how we can work together to get you there. 
So those are the two ideas. Make it about them or make it about us. And story structure it, holding off the middle, the solution for last, so that you've gotten the, the tension reduction that comes out of capturing their beginning and end. That's excellent as I thank you so much for you sharing. Um, this will probably be our last question. We often hear that showing vulnerability in speech is a great way to connect with the audience. How might one be vulnerable without appearing weak? Oh my gosh, it's, um, I love vulnerability. It's my favorite thing. It is where the humanity comes out and I found that to be absolutely true. The more vulnerability that you show, the, um, the, the more connection that you can make. In terms of the weakness, um, think of it this way. Um, as long as you get to a happy ending, the weakness is just a not so happy beginning. And there's nothing wrong with this. It's completely realistic to show vulnerability and show weakness. Then go to a good place. So I told a story once. It made sense at the time. It was a presentation that got me tear-jerking crying. You know, it really cracked me up. And I felt um, as I broke down and, and my eyes started filling up with tears, I started to get um, nervous about that. So what I did is I switched over to the other side. Well, here's the good that came out of it. And let me tell you where I am today. And so if you practice going to joy, going to happy, you can go to a vulnerable place and then switch to the positive place. So recognize vulnerability is associated with a not so happy beginning. All you have to do is reverse it when you're done and then go to a good place. And that vulnerability was fine. Excellent. Thank you for sharing and making it personal as well. Absolutely. So, well, again, we thank you all for attending this webinar today. We really appreciate you supporting us and Dean Hires in this webinar event. Um, another thing to look forward to are some upcoming events um, and courses that can further supplement what you learned today. The courses you see on this slide are just a few upcoming courses we offer. And please visit our website for full course lists and educational programs. We hope you enjoyed today's webinar as much as we did. Thank you and have a wonderful day.